Good morning, church. Hey. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Um, thank you for joining us to worship um, on this beautiful April morning. Thank goodness for the cool weather, right? Um, we have, we're so glad you're here. If you are a guest with us, we would be so happy for you to fill out a guest card and you'll find that in the pew right in front of you. Um, we do have a few things coming up. Um, we have um, a members appreciation um, class coming up on June 6th. And if you'd like to sign up for that to discover membership here at Trinity, there's a sign up outside on the table. We also have a women's luncheon coming up on May 8th, and we would love for you to come. It's right before Mother's Day. We'd love for you to um, bring a friend, bring your mom. Tickets are available for that. Those are $10 a piece. And Mother's Day is coming up, and we would love to see all of your shining faces here for Mother's Day. And bring a friend, bring a family member. We'd love to have all of you here for worship on that day. If you would stand with us. As we're going to pray. We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just uh, thank you this morning. We're so grateful that we get to come and sing praise to you, that we get to hear your word preached, that we uh, get to just... Uh, Tell you how much we love you today. God, we're thankful for the salvation that you've given us if we believe in Jesus Christ. And we're just thankful that your Holy Spirit is with us each and every day. Just uh, bless us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Glory be. 
on the, the acts of the, the, of the apostles, but also, of course, really the, the acts of the Holy Spirit in proclaiming Jesus Christ. So let me open up in prayer, but before I do, if you open up your heartbeat, you'll notice uh, we have an invitation for you. Do y'all believe in the power of prayer? Amen. Amen. And if you have something going on in your life right now, or maybe you know somebody who has something going on in their life, the prayer warriors decided that not just wanting to invite you to come and pray for people, but uh, they decided, why don't we invite people who need prayer? And so this is your invitation. You can put it on your refrigerator. Maybe right now you don't have anything that you can think of to be prayed for in your life. But if you would be put in your Bible or on your refrigerator, and if you ever have a time when you need someone to pray for you, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall, we have prayer warriors, and they would love for you to stop by, even if it was for 10 minutes, where they can pray for you. So this is your standing invitation to receive prayer from our prayer warriors. And of course, you, you're more than welcome to join them every Wednesday anyway, and to pray for other people. It's one of the greatest ministries of our church because it is uh, lifting up people to the throne of God in prayer. So that's your invitation. If you or someone you know needs prayer, uh, we invite you to come and we wanna pray for you or if you wanna pray for other people. The other announcement quickly I wanted to make is next Sunday we're having baptisms. And so if you've never been baptized by immersion, you've given your life to Christ, but you were never baptized by immersion, or maybe you've come to the point where you're rededicating your life, uh, we're gonna be doing baptisms next Sunday, so please just give me a, a call in the church office, and we will sit down and talk to you about what that means. So next Sunday is Baptism Sunday, so let's go to Lord in prayer and ask that he would speak to us today. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for each person that's here. Ask indeed, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts today. Give us a word from you, from your word, Lord. Let it sink into our souls. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, if y'all wanna turn in your Bible to Acts 3, uh, that's where we're going to begin. And uh, this week, uh, let me first ask, did y'all get the, the photos of the trucks? I, I don't know if you guys were able to get that. That was a, a last minute addition. Uh, we'll see if they did. But this week I've been really pondering the, the core part of this message. And the, the question of the week, it, it asks about your walk with the Lord. And so the question is, how is your walk with God? Is it weak? Uh, is it just for show? How is, how would you describe your walk with the Lord, your daily walk with the Lord? And, and here's why this is important. And, and if you write anything down from today, one of those things that you could write down, you could just really just take it with you the rest of your life. And here is the point. Your daily walk with the Lord matters to you and it matters to the people around you. It matters. It makes a difference. And so let me just see if they have those photos. They may not have, have pulled them up. But part of the, the thinking around this, of course, we're going to get into Acts 3. When we just see the daily walk, we see a little snapshot of the daily walk uh, of Peter and John. We just see it, and it's so beautiful how just they're going about their daily business. But this week, I'm part of a Facebook group that looks at old histories and uh, historical photos from the town that Kristen grew up in. And they posted a series of photos of a fire truck that they had received back in 1964. And they had pictures of it throughout the next basically 40 years. Uh, from the day it arrived to the day it was hauled off. And I'm looking through this and what struck me was the fanfare the day that it arrived. So I have the photos, but they may not pull up, but the photo of that arriving, you have the town manager there, you have the fire chief, and then the fire chief's brother was on the fire department, and they're standing around this incredibly beautiful fire truck. And then they had pictures of it through the next basically 40 years. To the very day they hauled it off, someone took a picture of the day they hauled it off. It was on the back of a, basically a wrecker, and it was all rusted out, you know, because it was New England, you know, and they put salt on the roads. No, they, but the town manager wasn't standing around it. There weren't people. It was just all by itself. And I thought to myself, isn't that just like our life? We kind of come into life with fanfare, right? Your parents are there. Maybe your grandparents come and you get pictures and, and all this hubbub. And then you get hauled away, right? You're kind of all by yourself, rusted out. You just get hauled off. And I was thinking, what difference did it make, that fire truck? 
But you know, it made a lot of difference. In a lot of people's lives, it would have responded over 40 years to car accidents, house fires, you name it. Uh, injuries, it would have responded. It made a difference. Even though all the people in the photo have passed on to glory, no doubt. It made a difference. And your walk with the Lord, it may not seem like it in the moment. Right? They, they may not have thought about the picture that was being taken back in 1964. But reality is that truck meant something to countless people over 40 years. Your walk matters to you. And your walk with the Lord matters to other people. Your walk with Jesus Christ makes a difference. And so let's take a look. I just want you to just kind of ponder that for a moment that it really does make a difference how you walk with the Lord, your daily walk with the Lord. And so are you all in for Christ or is it just for show? And so let's take a look. Acts 3, starting in verse 1 with this idea that your daily walk matters. It's important. So now Peter and John were going up together to the temple complex at the hour of prayer at three in the afternoon. And a man who was lame from birth was carried there and placed every day at the temple gate called Beautiful. So this is the, the temple gate. The name of it is the Beautiful Gate or Beautiful. So he, he could beg from those entering the temple complex. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple complex, he asked for help. Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, look at us. So they're walking up there, they're walking into the temple, they're at the, the beautiful gate, and they see this beggar here, he's laying, they could obviously, it would be obvious that he was incapacitated to some extent, and he asks for help, help me. And they look at him intently, they look down at him intently. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. Now I love this picture because this picture is Peter and John going to the temple complex at three to pray. It's a picture of them doing a normal thing. There are no, there's no doubt a group of people going into the temple complex to pray. They're doing what people do. They just live their everyday life. And they're walking up here, they're gonna pray, and other people are there, they're all just living their life. Just like you and I do. When this service is over, we're gonna leave these doors and we're gonna go do the things that we do on Sunday afternoon. We're gonna go and eat and we're gonna go and do yard, whatever it is, we're just gonna do life. But this, this situation also shows a beautiful picture of the, the DNA that was being established in the early church. They were together. They were going to worship. Okay, they were concerned about people. You see, no doubt people are passing by this guy. He probably is there a lot. And so they've gotten used to, it. you know, when we see something repeatedly, uh, we just ignore it. And so they, no doubt a lot of them are ignoring it. And they're walking up, they're living their daily life, but they're doing it together. They're establishing the DNA of the early church to worship together, to live together, and to minister together. It's that beautiful picture. And so they encounter this lame man, but they weren't going there to have an event or a spectacle. They're going there to pray. And it's such a beautiful picture of the movement of God. When you're living your life daily with Christ, opportunities to minister show up. And so they weren't planning this. This wasn't something that they had prearranged. They were just going, living their life. And any believer can pray to the Lord for someone else. Any believer. We don't have to wait for events. Right? We don't have to wait for special things. You, just as you're living your life, God can heal anybody and His Spirit, the Spirit of God goes with His people. So as you leave here today, and as we're walking out of these doors, if you're a child of God, you're indwelt by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God goes with you. And if you see a need, you don't have to wait for something to happen. You don't have to wait for an event. You know, you can pray for that person right there. And God can heal that person. And people need prayer. They want prayer. And they'll listen to you. So look what happens. So he looks at them, or they look at him, and then he looks back because 
This is now an encounter. They just had this special moment where they're walking up, living their life. He said, help me. And they look at him. He looks back. And they're about to speak to him. And he's going to listen to them. And you might think, well, and it's true in many ways. The world doesn't really want to hear what we have to say as a church. But they want to hear. They will hear what you have to say as an individual. Especially if it's prayer. Here's a trick you can try at home. Or with your friends or co colleagues. You can try this trick. And you can report back to me what the results are. But I'm going to predict the results. It will be 99% in one area. Let me show you what. This is a trick. Go up to somebody today and say, Can I tell you about my politics? Or two, Can I give you a sports analysis? Or three, Can I pray for you? 99% of the people are going to choose which number? Three. They're not going to want to hear your politics. They're not going to want to hear your analysis of sports. But if you would say to that waiter or waitress, if you would say to your neighbor, if you would say to your adult child, if you would say to your grandchild, if you would say to your spouse, can I pray for you? 99% will say absolutely. Now, you try that, and if it doesn't work, you let me know. Okay? You let me know. Say, you know what? No one asked. You know what? They're, they're going to say yes. And you might think, in a crowded restaurant, the waiter will say yes. I can pray for him. You better believe it. And as they're going, they look at him. They're living their life. But their walk with the Lord was so close and so sweet. And so they see this need. And there are a couple things about this that just want to focus our attention on just briefly. You see, your, as I mentioned earlier, your walk with Christ makes a difference to you and it makes a difference to other people. And notice that he was brought to the temple gate. Okay. In other words, they brought him there so that he could have his daily fish. Now, he wasn't, they weren't teaching him to fish, but they were teaching him, hey, you're going to go and you're going to beg for food and you're going to get your daily bread, so to speak, or your daily fish. But he could not fish for himself. And in many ways, there's no surer way to create dependency than to carry someone just far enough so that they will always need more. And this man was dependent on them to carry him because they would carry him just far enough so that he would always need more. And up until this moment, no one solved his real problem. Up until that very moment, no one solved his real problem. They met his daily needs by carrying him to the gate and hoping for the best. And I think about this. Where were the Pharisees at this moment? Yeah. Right? They love to hound and attack Jesus Christ, who would heal people. But they're not concerned, apparently, by his wounds, by his ailment. Where were the Pharisees? Where were the religious elite? Probably not being bothered by his brokenness. The religious elite, they love to attack the Savior who healed, but had no time for the real problems of the people. And maybe his disability made it too difficult to bring him through the gate. Notice, where do they set him? By the gate. Maybe his disability made it too difficult to bring him through the gate. Or maybe the religious elite said, you're unclean, you can't bring him through the gate. Because he was lame from birth. And, and the Pharisees might have said, look, you can't bring him through here. He's unclean. Or maybe they said, you know what, at the gate is where he's most likely to get the most money. Because that's going to be a choke point for people going into the, into the temple complex. So maybe it was just a very tactical move. At any rate, he's there at the gate. He's sitting there. And our spiritual forebears, if you will, Peter and John in this case, the early church, they're walking by and they see him. And they take an interest. Now take a look, Acts 3, 6 through 8. But Peter says, so that's basically the, the background. So they're walking up, they're just living their daily life because your daily walk matters to you and matters to other people. Where were the elite of the day? They weren't bothering with this guy. He was completely dependent on other people. And Peter said, I don't have silver or gold. See, what he wanted, at, what he thought he wanted was, hey, if, could you throw me some food or some money? But the next day, he would have needed that again. And so they, they know that's not what you need and that's not what we have. But what you need and what we have is something far greater than that. 
And you and I, when we live our life for the, the glory of God, when we're living our daily life, we may not have the, the silver and the gold. We may not have this or that. But what we have is what the world really needs, which is to know Jesus Christ. Amen. The world doesn't need another fish or another piece of bread. What it needs is to know how to fish and know how to make bread. In other words, it needs to get right with God. Because someday they're going to be hauled off like that fire truck. They're going to be hauled off. We all will. The question is, where are you going? Amen. See, that fire truck is being hauled off to be reclaimed and recycled. But you and I, we're going to be hauled off to go to glory. Amen? Amen. It matters how you live your life. And so they say, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. And that's really important. We're going to drill down on that a little bit today. Hey, I give you. Notice they, what they did not say is, but what we have, we're going to make some signs and have a big event and we're going to sell it to you. We're going to charge admission. No, I give this to you. Because the work of the Lord is not for sale. Amen. And now listen, they say, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then taking him by the hand, they raised him up. And at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up, stood, and started to walk. Notice it doesn't say, and he sat back down because he really preferred to be sitting on the ground. He jumped up. He was free. And that's why the world needs Jesus Christ. They don't know it, but, but they're on the ground. They're stuck on the ground in their sin. But when you're free from that sin, you're going to jump up. And watch what he does. He, he runs home. No, that's not what he does. You know where he went? He went into the temple complex. Amen. Which tells me maybe he was set there. Maybe they sat him down because that was the best place to get money. But there was probably something else going on. Probably he was rejected by the elite and they didn't want him in there. Because the first place he goes is inside. And when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody and they get right with their Lord and their sins are forgiven and the burden is lifted. They don't want to sit back down in the sin. They want to tell someone about it. In many ways, the most effective evangelists are new believers. Because they just had a radical close encounter with Jesus Christ and they ain't got over it yet. They want to just tell somebody about it. And so he jumped up, stood, and started to walk and entered the temple complex with them. And watch what he was doing. He was complaining that he was healed. No. What was he doing? He was praising God. He was praising him. I have been healed. Walking, leaping. What a sight that must have been. Right? I mean, think about it. You're in the temple complex. You, you walk by this guy a hundred times just in the last couple of months. And all of a sudden you look over and he's jumping around. Probably leaping like David, right? Because David, he was a dancer and a singer, right? And now, and now he's in the gate. And that leads to the second point. Miracles have a purpose and a point. And so anytime you see the movement of God, and we, you can use miracle, you can see the movement of God or an answered prayer, whatever it is. If God answers a prayer, if he does, he, he intervenes, he leans into our reality in some way. That movement of God has a purpose and has a point. In this moment, the purpose was to heal this man. That was the purpose of that miracle. It was a miracle and that was the purpose. It was to heal him. The point was to bring glory to God. Every answer prayer, every movement of God has a purpose. It has a point. The purpose is that immediate need. The point is God. Right? Not the person doing the, not the person who prayed for the miracle. The, the point of the miracle wasn't Peter and John. And you're going to see that in the text. But we would do well to remember that in our day. When you see these people on TV, they're acting like they're healing all these people. What they're, they're saying that they're the point. Right? That's about them. It's so unbiblical, it's unbelievable. 
Miracles have a purpose and they have a point. Signs and wonders, healing and miracles are for glorifying God, proclaiming his word and revealing Jesus Christ. That is the point. They are to reveal Jesus Christ, that to glorify God, proclaim his word. Miracles have a point and it's never profit. It's always to be freely given, just like prayer. So Acts 3, 9 through 11, all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple complex. Further evidence, they know who this guy is, they've seen him, and that means also they've walked by him many times. Now, lest we get condescending toward all these people, look, you and I pass by misery every single day. And these people were passing by misery every day, and they recognized, oh, that was that guy. That was a guy that we used to see over here at the gate. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him because they knew that this was a miracle. While he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, greatly amazed, ran toward them in what is called Solomon's Colonnade. And so they're running toward him. So now all of a sudden, this, this group of people, they're amassing because it's, it's a true bona fide miracle. And he's, he's hanging out with them, and he's holding on to them, and he's dancing, and he's praising God. Imagine his awe when on his own two feet, he walked those last few feet through the beautiful gate. It must have felt so good. He's been sitting there maybe, well, since he was a child, he's been laying maybe... Maybe for years, decades. And imagine the feeling that you would have on your own two feet. You walk the last few feet through a place you probably were forbidden to enter. And he walks through on his own two feet. It must have felt so good. And this is why when we used to live in South America, some of the people I would most enjoy doing street evangelism with were the people that came out of the worst backgrounds. People that had escaped from Colombia over into Ecuador. The things that they had done, but they, they were saved by the grace of God and they knew it. And they were saved from so much junk that man, they were fun to do evangelism with. Because they were fearless and they, they could just cut through somebody's baloney story really fast. It was fun because they were I don't want to say they were so saved, but I'll word it this way. They were saved from so much and they knew it. And this guy knew what he had been saved from. He isn't going to sit down on that ground anymore, being humiliated, hearing the snide comments. You know, people practicing their theology with their buddies as they walk by. Who sinned, him or his parents? He doesn't have to hear that anymore. He was healed. It makes a difference. And, and don't lose the part of this that's so important. Peter and John were just living their life. They didn't say, hey, let's go make a, let's go make a story for the Bible. <laughs> they were just living. What you and I do every single day, just living our life daily. And they were doing this, and it changed his life. And the people were filled with awe. You see, miracles have a purpose. For this one, it was to heal that lame man. And they have a point, which is to draw attention to the Lord. You know, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. Take a look, if you would. Ecclesiastes 1.9. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Look, I'm not going to argue that point with Solomon, because obviously he was the wisest man who's ever lived. But I will tell you this. While walking just around is old news, there's nothing exciting about walking. To the lame man and to those people who knew him, that miraculous healing was utterly amazing. That was something new to them. And I can tell you this, 
that, I mean, they're just going up to the temple. They probably have done this so many times. Maybe it's just, they're just walking into the temple. Just, it's just kind of those things, you know, when you're driving, you just kind of say, oh, look, I'm going this way because I normally go this way. We're not supposed to go the other way. You just kind of do that, that force of habit. They're just walking to the temple complex. It's this force of habit because that's what they do at that time of day. And all of a sudden they see this miracle. They see this guy running around. It made a difference to them. It was utterly amazing. And I'll tell you this, you could take, for them, it might have just been another boring day. The best way to not have a boring day is to start your day with a prayer. Amen. Best way not to have a boring day is to pray. I can only imagine that Peter and John, they probably, before they headed out, they had a word of prayer. So if you ever find yourself, Lord, I'm having a really boring day, just pray. See if God doesn't show up. Best way not to have a boring day is to pray. And so this thing, even though there's nothing new under the sun, it was an amazing thing. It turned that regular day into something that gave praise to God. Because your daily walk matters to you and matters to other people. And leads us to the third point. Miracles are not for personal gain. And so I've been coming back to this point because it's so important. Because we are confronted in our day with this thing called the prosperity gospel. Right? If you're just good enough, you, you get all of this stuff. Or with people on TV, they're just basically they're just trying to sell this idea that they're performing these miracles. And you can see it. You know, for a thousand dollars, you will be... Listen, the prosperity gospel is no gospel. And so not only are we fighting the world, but we all... Well, fighting, not literally the world, but fighting against the, the world system. But on the other hand, we've got this idea that there's this prosperity gospel. Well, you've probably heard of a 501c3, which is a nonprofit, but I can tell you this, the movement of God is the original, it is the first not-for-profit. And the church, we are to pray for people and we are to freely give what the Lord has given us, which is the grace of God, amen? Sure. The miracles of God are not for sale. Signs are for the Savior, wonders are not for the wallet. You don't 1099 the Holy Spirit. The movement of God is to be freely given by the church. That is, we are to freely pray for people. We are to go and we are to be the hands and the feet of, of Jesus Christ in our day. And the prosperity gospel is not the pure gospel. So what is the pure gospel? So you have this lame man, everybody knows it. You have Peter and John, they, through the, the grace of God, this man is healed. And listen to the gospel now. If anybody had an opportunity to say, hey, did you see what we just did, y'all? I think it would have been them in that moment because now they've gathered a crowd. But listen, they actually share the gospel, the real gospel. Listen to what they say. Acts 3, verse 12 and following. It's just, it's a beautiful picture of how we're to live our life in this day. Look, it's tough times out there. Now, I'm not speaking so much economically because right now there's, you know, there's been a lot of free money that's been printed in the last several years. But certainly morally, socially, there are all kinds of things going on. The church is to be the church. And we are to be the hands and the feet and the heart of Christ. So listen to the gospel. We're to be proclaiming the gospel. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people. So now there's this crowd forming and they're amazed. He addressed the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you stare at us? See, the prosperity of gospel would have said, yep, did you see who did that? Maybe got some fancy clothes and say, look at us. Listen to what they say. Why are you even looking at us? As though we had made him walk by our own power or godliness. They're taking the focus entirely off themselves because that's the point of the movement of God, the hand of God, a miracle of God, an answer prayer is to point people to Jesus Christ. And that's what the church needs to do today. That's what we need to do in everything is to point people to Jesus. Amen. That is the point of the working of the Holy Spirit. But you do not, now watch this, he said, by our own power of godliness. Verse 14. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. So he, they're recapping the crucifixion of Christ. 
You killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. So you killed him, but we've seen him resurrected. By faith in his name, his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through him has given him this perfect health in front of all of you. And now, brothers, I know that you did it in ignorance, just as your leaders also did. But what God predicted through the mouth of all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer, he has fulfilled in this way. Watch this, verse 19. Therefore, now here is the gospel. They're, they are in the, on the heels of a miracle. When everyone's looking at them and, and wanting to really, they're about to follow him, no doubt. They're like, don't even look at us. In fact, I'm going to remind you that you crucified Jesus. Right? Talk about taking away some popularity points with the crap. But watch what they say. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. That seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Verse 26, God raised up his servant and sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your evil ways. Wow. In this moment, they shared the gospel. How could they do that? Well, they're Peter and John. More than that, I mean, that's obvious, but more than that, they're just living their life daily. That's their walk. And you and I can do the same thing. Just live our life because your daily walk with Christ matters. And they're just living their life. And, and the natural thing for them to say <clears throat> is this. Repent. Turn back so you can be refreshed. Give your life to Jesus Christ. On faith. That's the natural response. And so when someone comes in through these doors or into a life group. Or you just meet them. Maybe a neighbor or a co-worker. Or someone on the street in the grocery store. Wherever it is. It's the natural thing is to point people to Jesus. Now, they obviously have some pointed words. But the point of what, where they were leading with all of it is this, repent and be refreshed. I think it was last Sunday I said, it is a horrible thing to do to someone, to point out their sins and not to tell them about the grace of God. It is a horrible thing. And sometimes we get into those habits. <clears throat> Look at them. <clears throat> you know the old saying, there but by the grace of God go I. Amen, right. But wait a minute, why don't you tell them the way? And this is what they do. Is Jesus, place your faith in Christ. <clears throat> when God uses someone like Peter or John or Paul or back in the Old Testament like Elisha, or Elijah, or Moses. It is for his glory and not for their gold. And so this concept that Peter and John are living out, okay, where they're saying, look, it's not about us. This, those people knew it because it, it, it's even shown very clearly in the Old Testament that the point of all this is really the glory of God. That wonders are not for the wallet, but for the Almighty. <clears throat> really quickly, I'm gonna go, if you take, a quick trip back in the Old Testament to 2 Kings 5. <clears throat> These people would have known this. The Jewish people would have known this. And the church needs to be reminded of this. Is that when we start our day in prayer. We're out or being in the hands and the feet of a part of Christ. It is for the glory of God. It is not for our glory. And so what happened was a man named Naaman. That's a commander of the army for the king of Aaron. This is 2 Kings 5, starting in verse 1. He was a great man in his master's sight and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aaron. This man was a brave warrior, but he had a skin disease. Now watch what happens in verse 5. Therefore the king of Aram said, Go and I will send you a letter with you to the king of Israel. So he wanted him to be healed. And he sent with them this, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 changes of clothes. And he went and he sent him there, Naaman there, to be healed. Well, Elisha hears about it, and this man, Naaman, encounters Elisha, and Elisha tells him what he must do. And the man, at first, he's kind of indignant. 
but he eventually follows him. I'm going to just kind of cut to it because of the interest of time. He, he follows his advice and he goes and he's healed. And he goes back to Elisha. And listen to what he says when he goes back to Elisha. Then Naaman, this is verse 15, and his whole company went back to the man of God. This is Elisha. They go back to Elisha, stood before him and declared, I know there's no God in the world except in Israel. Notice that the purpose of the miracle was to heal Naaman, but the point was to glorify God. And he goes back and said, now I know there's no God but the God in Israel. And watch what he says. Therefore, please accept the gift from your servant. So let me pay you for this. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, I stand before him. I will not accept it. Naaman urged him to accept it, but he refused. So he said to him, go in peace. And after Naaman had traveled a short distance from Elisha, Gehazi, that is the attendant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, my master has let this Aramean Naaman off lightly by not accepting from him what he brought. And so Gehazi, who's the assistant to Elisha, says, wait a minute, he brought all that stuff. And he went home with it. So he goes after Naaman and he goes, oh, by the way, you know, a couple prophets came and uh, we need some stuff. So Naaman gladly gives him some stuff. Please give them 75 pounds of silver and two changes of clothes. But Naaman insisted, please accept 150 pounds. He urged Hazai and then packed 150 pounds of silver in two bags and two changes of clothes. When Gehazi went back to Elisha, Elisha said, where did you go? Elisha asked him, your servant didn't go anywhere. He replied, so now he's lying. But Elisha questioned him, was it my spirit there when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is it a time to accept money and clothes, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen and male and female slaves? Therefore, Naaman's skin disease will cling to you and your descendants forever. So Gehazi went out from his presence, disease white as snow. That is a powerful story, and everybody in that temple complex would have known that story. And so they gather around Peter and John, and they're amazed. And Peter and John, they see what's happening. And they walked with Jesus when Jesus in his earthly ministry, they saw people's reactions to stuff. And we know that that Paul's going to have the same problem when, he, when hand, the hand of God moves through him is that people just want to rally around and somehow they want to cling on to him. And they're saying, no, not only don't look at us, but look, you're a sinner and you need to be saved by the grace of God. But when you do, you're going to have seasons of refreshing. It's not about us. And that's true in our day too. We are too. As we go out and we pray each day, we walk the daily walk with Christ. It's not about us. It's not about what we can get. It, look, it is about us knowing that that person without Christ is destined for hell. Amen. That's right. <clears throat> and so what we have, we freely give. We give to them, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his miracles are not for sale. The, the things that happen through the movement of the Spirit are not for sale. Jesus is not an independent contractor. God the Father does not subcontract the Holy Spirit. We are to freely give it to the world. And I say that because we are in a world where not only it's the world system, but it's also the prosperity gospel. And they're both charging fast at the regenerate church. And we need to reject them both. And it matters how we walk our daily life. The point to ponder today then is this. The entirety of your life should bring glory to God. The key to recognizing the spirit of God's movement, the key is your daily walk with the Lord. People who consistently recognize the hand of God in their life are people who consistently pray to God. They're people who consistently walk with the Lord. They're the ones who consistently recognize the movement of God. Now, I didn't say that they're the ones who cause the movement of God, but they do consistently recognize the movement of God, the people who consistently walk with God. 
That's the point to ponder is that everything you do, as we say, every decision a good one, your walk with the Lord matters. It matters to your children. It matters to your grandchildren. It matters to your neighbor. It matters to your spouse. How you walk with the Lord matters to people. And when God shows up, it's not for your glory. That's not the point. It is for his glory. It's an everyday walk. It's so simple, but so convicting. We must walk with God every single day. I'll say it again. People who walk with God consistently, they hear from him consistently. They recognize his voice. So ask yourself that question again, going back to the question of the week. How is your walk with Christ? Is it weak or are you all in for Christ every day? A deeper walk will change your life. It will even change your today. A deeper walk with the Lord. Your walk with God matters. And so in this world where we're just confronted with with heresy within the church and we're confronted with the sins of the world, we need to walk the line. And this beautiful picture of this healing of this lame man is is that, that thing that just draws our heart to the point of it all. We see a need. We meet a need. People respond and we don't take credit. Christ gets the glory. Amen. He's the point. The purpose was to heal him. The point was to glorify God. And if we can live with that in mind every single day, my walk matters. Just when you wake up in the morning, when we get out of bed, my walk today matters. It will matter to somebody. Maybe I won't see a healing, but it will matter. How I speak will matter. And when I see the movement of God, when God moves through a ministry of our church, it's not for our glory. It's for his glory. Amen. And when the people say, we want to rally around you, look, don't look at us. Look at Christ. And all of that, we freely give. We freely give. Gehazi found out the hard way. You don't 1099 the Spirit of God. <laughs> time and time again, the seven sons of Sceva, same thing, which we'll get to later on. What we've been given by the Lord, we were freely given by His grace, unmerited favor. And that we give to everyone else, Amen. freely to the world. Repentance and refreshing. Redemption for eternal life is free to all the Lord calls and to respond. Amen. That's, right. That's how our walk with the Lord matters. To live freely and give freely in the name of Jesus Christ. Would you join with me in standing? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for each person here. May we take something away from this message. That on the one hand, we don't walk by the needs that we see. On the other hand, we don't profit from your movement as you answer to us. On the one hand, the purpose is to heal, to help. On the other hand, the point is to glorify you. Lord, speak to our hearts. Remind us even now that our walk matters. For those that are here with their children, some have their children in preschool, but their children, Lord, their children are still in the home. Let them be reminded that your walk matters to your children. For those with grandchildren, your walk matters to them. For all of us, our walk matters to our neighbors, to our employees, to our friends, to our coworkers. It matters how we live our life. And Lord, let that sink into a heart that long before the world would ever want to hear our politics or our analysis of sports, it will gladly listen to our prayers for them. Let us lead with our strength, which is the spirit operating in and through us as your children. And before we want to go on a diatribe about something political or economic or sports or social, whatever it is, some things are very concerning, but before we launch into that, 
would we ask that person, how can I pray for you? May I pray for you? Is there something in your life I can pray for? And maybe, just maybe, we will see a movement of the Spirit of God in our country. When the lost hear the redeemed, praying for them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I want to go into a time of invitation. If God has spoken to you in some way, the Spirit of God, now obviously where you're at, maybe that could be your tabernacle. Just let the Lord's work with your in your heart right there where you're standing. But maybe you'd want to come west and, and scatter on my right. Uh, Doug is over here on my left. Their deacons, they'd love to pray with you. I'd love to pray with you. The altar, maybe you just want to come and do business. Maybe you just take your, your spouse by the hand and say, let's just go to the altar and pray together. Or maybe if you're here with your children, just take them to the altar and say, let's, let's pray that our walk would matter to each other and to others. Or maybe something else. Maybe you've walked in here this morning and you don't even know where you would go. Like when that fire truck got hauled off, just like that, you don't know when you're hauled off where you're going to go. But you want to settle that today? I'd love to pray with you. If you sense the Spirit of God, Say, you know, they might haul off this old body, but your spirit is going to be in eternity with him. Amen. How is God moving in your heart? The altar is open. Invitations here. If we can pray for you in any way, just in the silence, maybe also just do business with the Lord directly. Maybe bow your head and pray. How is God moving in your heart? How can we pray for you? Amen. Let me pray for you. Bonnie, you're coming up. I'll pray with you. I'm going to pray and dismiss. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. Heavenly Father, I ask blessings over each person in this place as we leave, that we would recognize that our walk matters. And it has an infinite matter. Infinite purpose and point should bring glory to you. Lord, I ask that you bless each person. Let us go. Leaping and rejoicing like that lame man, knowing that we haven't been healed physically as much as we've been healed spiritually, forgiven for our sins. Let us go in peace and enjoy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you want, you can step out back and enjoy a time of fellowship outside. I see Tiffany back there. If you want to check out, she's back there. So wave in her arm. So ladies, Stop in and see here. God bless you all.